In this presentation, we're going to review the structure and the function of the musculoskeletal system. Bone remodeling is an important concept in regards to the function of the skeletal system. And the internal structure of our bone is maintained by this process. It's a three phase process in which existing bone is resorbed and new bone is then laid down to replace it. There's clusters of bone cells called basic multicellular units that will implement remodeling. And these basic multicellular units are made up of bone precursor cells, which will then differentiate into either osteoclasts or osteoblasts. Precursor cells are located on the free surface of bones and along the vascular channels, especially within the marrow cavities. So the first phase is activation. And a stimulus like a drug, a hormone, maybe a physical stressor, or even a vitamin will activate the cytokine system, primarily the TNF or tumor necrosis factor superfamily. And it's going to form an osteoclast. Now osteoclast will then attach to the matrix by actin microfilaments and multiple other proteins that form a foot-like structure called a potosome poto meaning foot. Now once it's attached, the osteoclast integrin receptors will anchor its microfilaments to the extracellular matrix, providing receptor pathways between the osteocyte and bone matrix. Next, lysosomal enzymes that have been produced by osteoclasts will digest the bone and then release the degraded bone products into the vascular system. And after the bone is resorbed, the osteoclast will leave behind an elongated cavity, which we call the resorption cavity. This resorption cavity and compact bone follows the longitudinal axis of the haversian system. But the resorption cavity and spongy bone will parallel the surface of the trabeculae. Remember, it does not have a haversian system. Now, newborn formation um, New bone formation is going to begin when osteoblasts line the walls of resorption cavities and start to express osteoid and alkaline phosphatase. Forming sites of now calcium and phosphorus deposition. Now as the osteoid mineralizes, the bone will start to form. And once we have successive layers or lamellae, another way to say layers, within the compact bone, this resorption cavity is reduced to narrow haversian canals around a blood vessel. In this way, the old haversian systems are now being destroyed so that the new haversian systems can be formed. In spongy bone, new trabeculi are formed. And this formation phase takes about four to six months in humans. So activation, resorption, and then the formation of new bone. This remodeling process can repair microscopic bone injuries, but when there's gross injuries like a fracture or if we've had some type of surgical wound, it will heal by the same stages as soft tissue injuries, except that the new bone instead of scar tissue is going to be the final result. Now, the speed in which our bones are able to heal will depend on the severity of the fracture or the bone disruption, the type and the amount of the bone tissue that needs to be replaced, and the blood and oxygen supply that's available to the site. It also has to do with the presence of growth in thyroid hormones, insulin vitamins, and other nutrients, as well as the existence of systemic diseases, aging, and the availability of effective treatment. So think about immobilization and being able to prevent complications like infection. It's also important to note that spongy bone heals faster. So generally, um, hematoma formation will occur within hours of a fracture or um, a surgical injury. So that's the first stage. And then we have the formation of the procallus by osteoblasts, and this happens within days. 
Callus formation will then happen within weeks and then replacement and contour remodeling will take years, even up to four years in some cases. Now we're gonna move our discussion over to joints. A joint by definition is any site where two or more bones are attached. Sometimes we also refer to this as an articulation. The primary function of our joints is to provide stability and mobility. The joints function depends on its location and its structure as well. And generally joints that stabilize the skeleton have a very simple structure as opposed to um, other joints that provide mobility, they will have a little bit more complex structure. Now joints are classified based on the degree of movement that they permit or on the connecting tissues that hold them together. Now based on the movement, it can be classified as either an immovable joint or slightly movable joint or freely movable joint. And the terminology, respectively, is synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, or diarthrosis. Excuse me. So from connective structures, they are classified broadly as fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial. Okay, so we classify them in terms of structure, but also movement. And each of these three structural classifications, fibrous cartilaginous or synovial can be subdivided according to the shape and the contour of the articulating surface. Articulating surface means the ends of the bones and the type of the motion that the joint will permit. You can see in the schematic that our upper extremities can form movements like circumduction, extension, supination, pronation, and adduction. Our hips and legs can move by abduction, adduction, flexion, hyperextension, and extension. Our head, we have flexion and hyperflexion, rotation. Our foot, um, this is an example of dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, eversion, and eversion. So it all depends on the structure and also the location. So we'll first talk about fibrous joints. And these are joints where bone is united directly to bone by connective tissues, which we um, are then gonna call a fibrous joint. And these have no joint cavity and allow little, if any, movement at all. The fibrous joints are then subdivided into three types. So within the fibrous joint umbrella, we have sutures, syndesmosis, and gomphosis. A suture has a thin layer of dense fibrous tissue binds together interlocking flat bones in the skull of young children. Now sutures form an extremely tight union permitting no motion at all. So there's no motion in the joints of our skull. By adulthood, these fibrous tissues are replaced now by bone. So they're no longer joints, they're bones. A syndesmosis is a joint in which the two bony structures are united by a ligament or a membrane. And the fibers of these ligaments provide a flexibility and stretch. So it permits a limited amount of movement. The paired bones of the lower arm, like our radius and ulnar, and the tibia and fibula of our lower leg. These are examples of syndesmotic joints. A gomphosis is a special type of fibrous joint where there's a conical projection fitting into a complementary socket. It's held together by a ligament. Our teeth are held in the maxilla or our mandible. This is an example of a gomphosis joint. Cartilaginous, um, excuse me, cartilaginous joints, these are uh, symphysis or synchondrosis. So those are two types. A symphysis is a cartilaginous joint where bones are united by a pad or a disc, and we call this fibrocartilage. 
A thin layer of hyaline cartilage usually covers this articulating surface, and the thick pad of fibrocartilage is acting as a shock absorber or a stabilizer. So an example of a symphysis type joint are the symphysis pubis. We hold two pubic bones together, and it's easy to remember because it's in the name as well, symphysis pubis. The intervertebral discs, they join the bodies of the vertebrae. Now moving on to um, a synchondrosis. This is a joint where the hyaline cartilage rather than the fibrocartilage is connecting the bone. These joints can be found in the ribs, in the sternum. These are all called synchondroses. Now the hyaline cartilage of these joints, we sometimes refer them as the costal cartilage and you probably remember this from health assessment. Now slight movement at these synchondroses between the ribs and the sternum will allow the chest to move outward and upward while we're breathing. Next we have synovial joints and these are described as either uniaxial, biaxial, or multiaxial and it depends on the shape of the bone ends and the type of movement that is allowed. Now usually one of the bones is stable and it serves as an axis point for the motion of the other bone. And the movement is made possible by various synovial joints. They're either circular or angular type movements. The articular capsule or joint capsule is fibrous connective tissues that cover the ends of bones where they meet in the joint space. So remember Sharpie fibers from earlier? They firmly attach the proximal and distal capsule to the periosteum. Ligaments and tendons may reinforce that capsule. It's composed of parallel interlacing bundles of dense white fibrous tissue, and it is supplied by nerves, blood vessels, and lymphatic vessels. Now nerves that lay in and around the joint capsule are very sensitive to the rate and the direction of motion, compression, tension, vibration, and even pain. The synovial membrane is smooth, it's very delicate, it's an inner lining of joint capsule and is found in the non-articular portion of the synovial joint and any ligaments or tendons that traverse this cavity. It's composed of two different layers. Within the synovial membrane, we have the vascular subintima and then we have a thin cellular intima. The vascular subintima will merge with the fibrous joint capsule and it's composed of very loose fibrous connective tissues, elastin, fat cells, fibroblasts, macrophages, and even mast cells. The cellular intima consists of rows of synovial cells that are embedded in this fiber-free intracellular matrix. And there's two types of cells here. We have A cells and B cells. Now A cells are macrophages and they ingest and remove by phagocytosis bacteria and particles of debris within the joint cavity. Whereas the B cells are fibroblasts and they are the most numerous and they secrete hyaluronine. Um, and this gives the synovial fluid a viscous quality. Now hyaluronate is used in other aspects of health and I want you to look that up and see where you can make that connection. Hyaluronate. Now the synovial membrane is also supplied with blood and lymphatic vessels and it's capable of rapid repair and regeneration. In these spaces, there's no um, uh, supply of nerves. Now in the synovial cavity or the joint cavity, it's enclosed, it's fluid filled space. And think of synovial um, fluid itself, which we're gonna be talking about in the next slide. So it is between articulating surfaces of two different bones, which we term as the joint space, and it enables these bones to move against one another without friction. It's surrounded by synovial membrane and filled with this synovial fluid. You think about which joints have synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is a super filtrated plasma from blood vessels and it provides lubrication to these 
articulations. It nourishes the pad of the articular cartilage and it covers the ends of the bones. While hyaluronic acid in the synovial fluid gives it an important biochemical property. It also contains free floating synovial cells and various leukocytes that phagocytose joint debris and microorganisms. So it cleans it up. Articular cartilage is a layer of hyaline cartilage and it covers the end of every bone in this um, articular cartilage or articular joint space. Um, it can be thick or thin depending on the joint size and it can fit um, it depends on how those two bone ends will fit together. It also depends on the amount of weight and shearing force that the joint normally can withstand. So what's the function of this articular cartilage? It's to help reduce friction in a joint to distribute the forces of weight bearing and it's composed of chondrocytes. So chondrocytes are cartilage cells and an intracellular matrix is also part of the articular cartilage. And within this matrix, we have type two collagen. We also have proteoglycans and water. The water content ranges from 60% to almost 80% of the net weight of cartilage. So cartilage is mostly water. Now all the surface of, um, at, at the surface, of this articular cartilage, the collagen fibers will run parallel to the joint surface and they're closely compacted into a very dense protective mat. In the middle layer, we call this the proliferative zone. The fibers are arranged tangentially to the surface, allowing them to deform and absorb some of the weight bearing. Now in the bottom layer, which is called the hypertrophic zone, the fibers are perpendicular to the joint surface. And this allows them to resist shear forces and they're embedded in a calcified layer of cartilage called the tide mark. The significance of the tide mark is that it will anchor the collagen fibers to the underlying bone. And collagen fibers are important components of cartilage matrix because they account for about 60% of the dry weight and they anchor the cartilage securely to the underlying bone. Also, it provides a very taut framework for cartilage. It controls fluid loss from cartilage and it prevents escape of protein polysaccharides from the cartilage. The proteoglycans, which are those protein polysaccharides, give the articular cartilage its stiff quality and it regulates movement of the synovial fluid through the cartilage. These proteoglycans are macromolecules consisting of proteins, carbs, and hyaluronic acid. We have another question here to test our knowledge. The type of joint that's connected by a joint capsule is A, a fibrous joint, B, synovial joint, D, a diarthrosis joint, or D, a cartilaginous joint. You might want to pause the presentation and look through your notes. If you picked B, you're correct. Joints are classified by the type of connecting tissue that's holding them together. So fibrous joints are connected by fibrous tissue, ligaments and membranes. Cartilaginous joints are connected by fibrocartilage or hyaline cartilage. Synovial joints are connected by fibrous joint capul uh, capsules with synovial fluid. Now joints are classified as synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, or diarthrosis, depending on the degree of movement that they allow. So that terminology has to do more with movement than composition. 